this corner of England, beautiful with a hint of secrecy which haunts it as the memory of a dark and tender sadness clouds the brilliance of a summer day. For me, the hint of secrecy is certainly the memories, some sad, some glad. Most broader files have been coming here for years and every corner holds memories. I often find myself saying things like, I have a photo of my dad here in 74, or we used to have tea and scones here with my mum. Moments in time, all too quickly fly past. But here we are again, with my sister Sharon and Edward, her husband, and my good friends Mike and Elizabeth. We'd picked up a boat in Roxham, and after a leisurely cruise down the River Burr, we reached the renowned Swan Inn, had a chat with other broader files, then al fresco dining in the sunshine, with Prince Michael and Princess Elizabeth overlooking the river and great food. Happy we'd found a mooring spot here. I had the steak pie. Then off to enjoy the broads on a beautiful summer's day in June. I have to admit I was getting that nice-to-be-back feeling. All the old familiar sights. I believe there is amongst most broader files the habit of cruising down the river, having a nice chat, perhaps a cuppa. And for me, shooting sights that I've shot a hundred times, knowing I now have a better camera, and don't want to miss anything. We're now cruising along what is certainly one of the most famous parts of the Broads that takes us from Horning down to Ranworth. For those unfamiliar with the Norfolk Broads, they're a mixture of rivers, lakes, canals, and old peat diggings that were later flooded when the sea levels rose, usually only a few feet deep. Here we're cruising down the river Burr, pronounced Burr in Norfolk, that enters the sea at Great Yarmouth. Some of the houses are big, others just iconic. Windmills were used not only to mill grain here, but also drain the land. Some places like the Ferry Inn are historic. There was a ferry here that closed only a few years ago that had crossed the river here for a thousand years. You see, the nearest bridge is four miles away, so it's eight miles by road, and about 80 feet by boat. The herons around here are quite tame. We soon arrive at Ramworth Dyke, 
that takes us to Malthouse and Renworth Broads. I need to explain at this point that Mike and Elizabeth had driven me to Roxham from Chelmsford and had spent the day with us on the boat. We were giving them a sightseeing experience that comprised the trip to Renworth. Unfortunately, there were no mooring spaces at Renworth Stathe, so we had a leisurely cruise back to Roxham, where my son Nate and his wife Amy were due to arrive at 7 p.m. to spend the weekend with us. It was nevertheless a very pleasant experience as we chatted and made our way back. in Southern California there, up in the mountains. Uh, they do a lot of, have a lot of boats and a lot of pleasure boats on the lake. And they put portaloos on top of rafts and float them on the lake. So it gives a whole new meaning to a floater. We left Renworth at five o'clock and it will take us about an hour and 45 minutes to reach Roxham. So we had a fun time messing about on the river. Looking back, that was an absolutely great start to our holiday. The evening time is my favorite time to cruise. Most boats are moored up. The evening sunshine is special. and it's the golden hour for photography. Roxham is sleeping when we arrive. We moored up, said bye to Mike and Liz, and then Nate and Amy arrived, and not wanting to moor up in the boatyard, we cruise back down the river to Salhouse Broad, where we moored up for the night. A great day. Waking up in Salhouse Broad brings back a thousand memories. It's a great place to enjoy an evening meal as the sun sets and a pleasant breakfast next morning. Sal House is unusual in that it was formed as 10th century sand and gravel diggings flooded, not by peat diggings as with most of the other broads. We're cruising toward Horning. For me, the magic of a trip on the broads is the boat itself. There's something about being on the water that makes life relaxing. And Horning, early morning on a summer's day, is a delightful place. I've often wanted to record the trip from Horning to the Ferry Inn, where one can simply sit on the boat and watch the world go by. So I put a wide lens on the camera and put the camera on the front of the boat and let it roll. You'll notice there are not many boats moving. That's because it's late afternoon. You can imagine how enjoyable this trip was.
Well, that was the trip in 20 times the speed. This is the trip as it happened. One of the reasons why the broads first became popular is that it gave city dwellers the chance to get out into the countryside and see the wildlife. When the kids were young, I gave a pound to the first who spotted a heron. There would be about five sightings a week. Nowadays, we can see about 10 a day, which says a lot for the conservation people who helped make that happen. Here's me shooting a passing boat. And here's my shot. Likewise, shooting the family. An interesting fact is that in the 12th century, the east of Norfolk had one of the most dense populations across the country. The forests were cleared as people sought both fuel and timber for building. The rivers here clearly enabled the movement of goods, even in early days. In latter times, this was facilitated by the Norfolk Wherry one of the earliest forms of transport on the broads. A wherry can carry around 25 tons of goods and was king here for around 200 years. I've been coming to the broads for many years and if you ask me the biggest change that's occurred during that time, I'd have to say it was the boats. Both the design and the facilities have greatly improved but so too has the cost. My sister commented that two people can take a Mediterranean cruise cheaper than hiring one of the new boats. Now there's food for thought. We soon arrived in Ranworth praying hard for a mooring space, but it's quite full. But suddenly, someone left just as we were arriving, and we moored up. The berth gives us the opportunity to take on water. Ranworth is my favorite place on the broads. It's a great place just to watch the goings on. Check out the latest boat designs and empty the rubbish and maybe take a walk. The Maltsters has good meals. There are some takeaway restaurants nearby that now deliver to the Stathe. We're in Ranworth and it's a beautiful day. Slight breeze, but not too windy. The Norfolk Wildlife Trust has an information centre here and there are plenty of mooring spots, though because of its popularity, never enough. Great place to eat and my sister is getting the grub ready. Breakfast time. We got the morning papers from the shop the weather is holding up. And so, 
we decided to take the Helen of Renwith electric boat on the Renwith Broad nature trip. Always a pleasure and always an opportunity to get to know what's been happening. Often seeing marsh harriers, cormorants, perhaps otters, herons, and occasionally a swallowtail butterfly. After the cruiser, it's quiet and peaceful. Boats other than the Helen of Ranworth are not allowed into Ranworth Broad. The warden's always a great source of information about the wildlife. Mother Grebe on the nest. The black-headed gulls. Afterwards, a visit to the Broadland Conservation Centre and Shop, which is also a museum and lookout point. They even supply binoculars and a telescope. There's a boardwalk here where the swallowtail butterflies are often spotted. So we took a stroll through the car woodland, past the village hall, and up to the church. Stopping for a snack. One of the joys of coming on the Broads is to come up to St. Helen's Church, the Cathedral of the Broads, come in the little coffee shop here and have some of their soup, a cup of tea, a scone with fresh cream, apple pie. And here it is. On a day like today, one should take the 89 spiral steps to the top of the church tower for some spectacular views. Here we get an idea of how flat Norfolk is, how rural and relatively undisturbed. Then we take a stroll back to the Stathe. I'm always impressed by the woodland just before the Maltster's pub. It's a fascinating place and very photogenic. Ranworth was once quite a thriving village with a prosperous pub and several malt houses. The wool weavers and traders of the area are said to be responsible for the fine church. Today it's no more than a hamlet but because of the boats, it has many visitors, the Stathe being very popular. So off we go again. The first thing we see is the wherry yacht Olive sailing into Malthouse Broad, picturesque and graceful, gliding along, a reminder of when the wherries were king. Passenger wherries like this had white sails, the trading wherries had black sails. We're planning to cruise up to Wayford Mill to moor for the night. First down the burr. Then up the Ent. 
We soon reach Howe Hill, my second favourite place on the Broads. The scenery here certainly epitomises the Broads. the restored windmill. The Howe Hill House, a beautiful Edwardian manor house. It's a great place to stop off for several reasons. So we tie up the boat and take a walk. Two old passenger worries were moored up too. Nate checked out the info. There's wildlife to see on the pasture, the toad hole cottage. But it's our plan to return when we have more time. So we continue our journey. The wherry is the Hathor, who, as you may know, was an Egyptian goddess and is depicted by a woman with the head of a cow. I have a suspicion the name is due to the fact that Hathor was also honoured as the goddess of the afterlife in the field of reeds, which was the Egyptian land of the dead. So it's therefore apt that Hathor is still among the reeds. Earthstead is a peaceful village with beautiful thatched houses and where, it seems, the birds never stop singing. It's right next to Barton Broad, which after Hickling is the second largest broad. So we get a sudden change of scenery. The wind gets up. There's a wide expanse of water that soon gives way to the river again as we continue up the Ent. This is Heron country, and there's generally a few around, especially in the evening. The last thing we pass is Hansett Mill, the most photographed mill on the broads. What a pleasant day it's been. In that country of luminous landscapes and wide horizons, where the wind runs in the reeds and the slow rivers flow to our cold sea, a man may still sense and live something of the life of the older England, which was uninhibited, free and natural. So wrote Alan Savory in his book, Norfolk Fowler, and we're experiencing it. We've just left Wayford Bridge and are on our way down the Ent to the ruins of St. Bennet's Abbey. Wildlife on the way. A beautiful summer's day in Norfolk. Norfolk, by the way, simply means North Folk or Northern people. Suffolk is the South Folk. 
Its history is fascinating. The Romans were here, and Boudica, queen of the Ikeni, a local girl, fought them. The Vikings were here, and actually many still remain. Some important people too. Lord Nelson grew up not far from where we are now. George Washington's forebears went to America from a village only a few miles away. Albert Einstein lived here after he fled Hitler. Even the legendary American Indian Pocahontas lived not far away. We passed the windmill five, six times, and now we're going again. Get it more, more and more shots with our wide this time. And hopefully it'll be a perfect shot. But we're back at Hanset Mill again. This time, just about as good as it gets. For Broderfiles, there are certain places that stir the memories. For me, it was my dad here, back in 1974, wearing his captain's hat and a broad smile. A day like today called for a video shoot. We actually turned the boat a couple of times to make sure we had some good shots. So we're going back here and soon we'll turn around again. It was fun. Great shots. We're now heading to Barton Turf on the north edge of Barton Broad. This place is also a historic place. Lord Horatio Nelson was born here. He was also the Duke of Bronte, but no relation to the famous sisters. The stay at Barton Turf is a great place to have lunch on the boat and take on water. It's a very pretty place. This is the stays from which Lord Nelson would have learned to sail. He would be visiting his sister just over the trees here and he would come down here as a teenager and he learned to sail here. And this is the expansive Barton Broad, one of the largest broads. It's still a popular place for sailing boats and the flat open countryside makes for good sailing conditions. On a breezy day the wind fair rattles through this place. But it's time for lunch. Come and get it. Then we make our plans. It is really a very nice day today. Excited sailors prepare for a sail. The wind is getting up a little. So we continued our journey. into Barton Broad. The Sunday crowd getting ready to race. Then up through Ersted again.
its beautiful thatched homes, mock Tudor houses, and manicured lawns. So glad to be in England now that summer's here. I've been coming here for 54 years with four generations of family and friends, and it's therefore a special place with memories around every bend and broad. So it's not just an aesthetic experience for me. I'm enjoying floating through nature, a gentle breeze in my face, like the breath of God stimulating the spiritual senses as eyes and ears enhance the experience. I love it. Next is Ludham Bridge, half a mile from the village. A great stop-off for boats to take on water and get supplies, perhaps a snack. When on a boat, one always has to take the opportunity to replenish supplies when it thus presents itself. And this we did before setting out to St. Bennet's Abbey, a very important place in the history of Norfolk. You've probably heard of King Canute. He was here too. He granted this piece of land to the holy men living here a thousand years ago. He was the king of Denmark, England and Norway that was referred to as the North Sea Empire. But he's usually misrepresented as an arrogant king who believed he had miraculous powers when in actual fact his famous act of commanding the tide not to come in was to illustrate to his courtiers that he had no such power. This is how the abbey might have appeared toward the end of the Middle Ages, today quite different, as a Georgian windmill was built over the gatehouse, parts of which remain. Here the ancient wall, a thousand years old, still standing. The gatehouse, the main entrance to the abbey, was ornately decorated. The mill that replaced it in the 1720s still remains, as does the back part of the original gatehouse. The mill is the oldest tower mill on the broads, and visitors may freely enter and peruse. The back arch of the gatehouse, still standing. It's a very impressive monument. A thousand year old gatehouse with a 1970s windmill in it. The cross marks the place where the ancient church once stood. Nate had a small drone and was giving it a try. Drones have come a long way since then. They give us great perspective on places. What next? We're close to the South Walsh and Broads, so we decided to take a look. This is another place that for me has always held a lot of memories, and both the inner and outer Broads are beautiful, though quite different. When viewed from the air, it appears the burr was rerouted though I could not find any evidence of this canal being cut.
The outer broad is surrounded by thatched houses. We briefly entered into the inner broad, which is quiet with many birds. We then slowly made our way back up the bird to Roxham in the evening sun. I particularly enjoy the evenings on the broads. One reason is that most boats have moored up already and the waterways are relatively quiet. The quiet of the evening as the sun sets and people take it easy. up through Horning. The tour boats doing the evening cruise. It's been another great day. When we awoke on Monday morning, it was to a glorious day. Not only sunshine, but my favorite sky with fluffy white clouds that make for great photography. And I'll give all you fellow broadophiles a great treat today. A trip down the River Bure in ideal conditions. The sunshine, the clouds, a warm day, a gentle breeze, and me being less verbose than usual, no longer subjecting the viewers to my chronic loggeria. Perhaps. So here you can relive the trip with us from Roxham to the Stracy Arms. For the videographers, the camera is the Sony Z100, 30 frames a second, shotting UHD with a polarizing filter for the sky and water, XAVC codec, handheld, stabilized in post.
We're leaving Wroxham, heart of Broadland, and thoroughly enjoying cruising down the River Bure. Edward, my brother-in-law, is the captain, and Henry Heron is a good friend and will pose nicely for me. My favourite house on the Broads? The Norfolk Broads has to be one of the most beautiful places in Britain, but one can only really experience it from a boat. Down the bill we go. Soon arriving at Roxham Broad. A broad, by the way, is simply a term for a broad expanse of water. Here only called a broad. Elsewhere, a lake. In Scotland or Ireland, a loch. And in the Lake District, perhaps a town. Broadophiles will refer to a holiday here as going on the broads, which can cause confusion across the pond, the Atlantic pond that is, where a broad has a completely different connotation. For videographers, I'm also using a Sony AX100 and a cheap fisheye lens. Next stop will be Salhouse Broad where we'll drop anchor and have lunch. For nature lovers, these ducks are young mallards, and the swan's name is William. Salad and sandwiches on the menu. The restaurant has a great location. After lunch, we press on Past the beach at Salhouse. Salhouse Broad is a flooded sand pit. If nothing else, the Broads are relaxing. We cruise along at a leisurely four miles an hour. Horning is the next place through which we pass. Apparently it means the folk who live on the high ground between the rivers. I presume the rivers are the Bure and the Ant. But as you can see, there's not much high ground. It is picturesque. In fact, described as the prettiest village on the Broads. The Swan Inn here is possibly the most iconic inn on the Broads. I call the stretch from the Swan to the Ferry Inn the Horning Mile. And it's always a joy to be here. The Village High Street is a variety of shops and there are some great places for meals. The Statham Willow the new inn, as well as the swan.
Like Roxham, Horning has many beautiful homes. From above one can see there are many interesting backwaters accommodating both houses and boats. even a decorative windmill. One interesting fact about the village is that the Ferry Inn was largely destroyed in the Second World War bombing raid in April 1941, during which 15 bombs were dropped on Horning and the surrounding area by a single aircraft. Most landed in the marshes, but one hit the ferry and one hit the inn, where 21 of the 24 people in the pub at the time were killed. One can only surmise the pilot thought the river was an airstrip. Next stop, the bridge at Akel. then on through Stokesby to the Stracy Arms. To moor for the night.
another great day. Next morning we set out early from the Stracy Arms. An interesting sky, but not much sun. We're heading down the Bure towards Yarmouth. It's flat countryside, and apart from the occasional windmill, there's not much to see. Great Yarmouth is a historic place. Dickens wrote David Copperfield here and describes it as the finest place in the universe. Daniel Defoe wrote about it in his journals, and long before that, the Romans were here. It lies at the confluence of the rivers Yare and Bure. This is where they meet and flow out to the North Sea. But we're heading up the Yare, through Braden Water, and what was in times past a large bay. Braden Water is the biggest expanse of water on the Broads. Uh, it goes out to the sea and it is connecting the northern and the southern broads through Great Yarmouth. It is actually very nice to travel across here and today, though it's quite windy, it's still quite pleasant. Our destination is St. Olive's. Lunch in the Bell Inn, though the sun has deserted us. We're able to moor up right outside the pub, which is the oldest recorded pub on the Broads. After lunch, we decided to visit the St. Olive's Priory an English heritage site founded in the early 13th century. Olaf was the 11th century king who converted Norway to Christianity. These ruins date back to 1216. It was finally suppressed by Henry VIII. Here the cloisters stood and to the left was the church. This building is the refectory above and under Croft below. The undercroft is a cellar or storage room, often brick-lined and vaulted, and used for storage in buildings since medieval times. The refectory or dining room was above. Refectory is from the Latin reficere to make or restore, and refectorium means a place one goes to be restored, from which we get our word restaurant. This illustration here gives an idea of what it would have looked like around 1350. The canons here were priests and would have wanted to identify with the early apostles and so liked to eat in the upper room. After Henry VIII suppressed the monasteries, a house was built using the remains of the priory. On the top of the walls we can still see where the beams were placed. These are the ruins of that three-story house. Today llamas are kept nearby. The last time I saw a llama was in Peru. That's a long time ago. Then we continued our journey to Beckles. At Summerleton, the railway swing bridge had to open to allow a large yacht through. We tagged along though our boat would have been able to go under the bridge. It was the first time I actually saw it open.
We had a pleasant cruise down to Beckles with interesting skies, though not much sunshine. Beckles is in Suffolk and this part of the Broads is referred to as the Southern Broads. Beckles is an interesting place to visit and it's well worth stopping off and exploring. After circling around we continued to Ulton Broad. Cheese nachos snack on the way. We soon arrived in Alton Broad, where we would moor up for the night. I feel exhilarated, and furthermore, Alton Broad is another place that for me is full of memories. Plenty of places to eat, shops to replenish supplies. The key here has good shower and toilet facilities. The Wherry Hotel at the end of the Broad has great food. And just opposite the key, there are several restaurants. It's been another good day. Next morning we were blessed by another sunny day. That's good because we have a long day of cruising ahead. Our stay in Ulton Broad has been enjoyable, but we're looking forward to cruising up to the Northern Broads through Great Yarmouth. I'm always envious as I look at the beautiful homes that border the broad with their magnificent views and manicured lawns. Edward has taken the wheel and the broad is all but deserted on this Wednesday morning. If I travel here from Brundle, it's usually on a Saturday night, and on Sunday as we leave, it can be like a Henley regatta here. This morning our conversation is all about the pros and cons of the places we are passing. I must say that slowly cruising through the broad, camera in hand, coffee next to me, is a typical broad's experience. The herons almost look artificial. Good thing she moved her leg. And then we have breakfast as we cruise. The smell of kippers. But fortunately, there's a nice breeze. Kippers on toast. For those who don't know what a kipper is, it's a smoked herring. And it's without any shadow of doubt my favorite breakfast dish. Unfortunately, the sun appears to have disappeared. We're now entering Centaurus, traveling with the tide and making good time, 
past the Bell Inn. We should reach Great Yarmouth in an hour or so. As we enter Braden Water, the breeze has got up a little. The largest expanse of water on the Broads, it's exposed to the elements and gets interesting sometimes. We soon reach Great Yarmouth. It's slack tide and we've had the tide with us so far and are making good time. As the tide turns, we'll also have it with us as we head up the Bure. It's noon and nothing much is happening. I would have expected more boats as this is the ideal time to pass through. On days like this, it's mainly put the camera away, have a cup of coffee and reminisce. Lunch at the Ferry Inn. Good English fare. with a view. Now just look at that. The good news is by the time we finished an hour or so later, a UFO had appeared in the sky that was later identified as the sun. Had we had this weather an hour ago, we should have enjoyed Al Fresco dining on the lawn. Such is the fickleness of English weather. We're not complaining. Things look quite different when the sun emerges. So our spirits are up as we continue our journey. Ickle Bridge signals our arrival in the Northern Broads. In another hour, we will be enjoying different perspectives. In many ways, these waterways are unique. The majority of the Broads being man-made. But with numerous rivers connecting them all, to create this waterway wonderland of sailing boats, windmills, amazing scenery, and perhaps most important of all, the wildlife. We're on our way to Potterhayam and dropped into Womack Water for a quick look. It's a nice place to moor for the night, but as it's only 5 p.m., we're still exploring. Sailing boats are common here as Hickling Broad is nearby. The Norfolk Wherry Trust also has trips. We're now travelling up the River Thurn to Potterhayam, a delightful place. The houses on the banks of the river here tend to be small as access is often limited. A very scenic location with some fascinating buildings. The bridge at Potterhayam is iconic. Though it's slowly sunk over the years, 
and now only allows very small vessels to go under. It dates back to 1385. We actually just did a U-turn without stopping. We're now really enjoying what has to be the best time on the broads as the evening sun sets. One thing I like is wherever you go on the broads, you hear the bird song. Different kinds of birds in different places, but it's just music all the time wherever you go. Difficult to believe the cloud and wind we had earlier, though it's still a little windy. Today has been strange in that we've been cruising all day. It's nevertheless been very enjoyable. Taking in the sights, having a chat, soaking in the atmosphere of this amazing place. We're back on the Bure, this time passing St. Bennett Sabby again. and then heading up the River Ant to Ludham Bridge and beyond. Cruising in the evening time is just, I think, the best time and uh, many people will moor up early to get a mooring place. So it is difficult to get a mooring place, but the joy of just cruising along and enjoying the broads in the evening with very few boats still floating is tremendous. I love it. How Hill next stop. Is moored up. Still a nice breeze. Ersted is next, and then we enter Barton Broad as the sun sets. And believe it or not, we've managed to get a mooring at Barton Turf that is perfect. What a day it's been. Oh, and we managed to walk a total of six minutes all day. Early morning on the broads and waking up to the sound of birdsong in a beautiful location. Bright sunshine and a gentle breeze. The green at Barton Turf is historic. Bordering Barton Broad, it's also scenic. And the Norfolk Wildlife Trust can always be trusted to play their part in making this place a wildlife haven. On this occasion, Someone enhanced the experience by parking their British Racing Green Morris Minor 1000 convertible on the edge of the broad. Those were the days. So we start the day with a classic car and a classic view of the Norfolk Broads. The stories this place could tell, if only it could speak. We've reached our last full day here, and the senses are exaggerated. We're making the best of everything. So off we go, 
south into Barton Broad. Sharon at the wheel. We've decided to cruise up Lime Kiln Dyke toward Neatis Head. The dike is narrow, but the scenery is classic broads. I love days like this. Not a boat in sight, quiet, peaceful, beautiful weather. Delightful homes. For me, the idea that I can moor my boat at the bottom of the garden and then join nature is heaven. We've rolled back the roof, essentially making the living area open air, so we can sit in the living room with a coffee and be blessed by nature passing on all sides. Back up to Barton Broad. Seeing others enjoy different activities. Some getting ready for a sail. The breeze is brisk and Barton Broad is a great place to sail. The River Ant at Ersted is one of the most scenic places on the Broads. Always serene and filled with birdsong. Not to mention beautiful homes. So on to How Hill once more. Today the wherries are moored here. History afloat. Intriguing. Everybody has questions. My question was, can I take a look inside? This wherry is the Hathor, built by D.S. Halls of Reedham in 1905, and is on the register of National Historic Ships in the UK. And I get to see the interior. As previously mentioned, Hathor was an Egyptian goddess of the afterlife in the field of reeds. But I later found out the boat was named in memory of the owner's brother, who died in Luxor in 1897. She's one of only six surviving Norfolk pleasure wherries. I visited here many times, but one of the lasting pleasures is to ride the electric eel through the reeds, have a chat with the knowledgeable wardens, find out the latest wildlife news, and enjoy a different perspective on the broads. I've yet to meet a warden who is not a pleasure to sail with. Away from the noisy cruisers, here the loudest noise is when a reed hits my camera. So I might look a bit muddy and murky, that's really just the, the peak being churned up. What we haven't got is too many nutrients, nitrates and salt. The information one gleans from the wardens gives the visitor a better understanding of the whys and wherefores of the broads. Once in deep reedland, we moor up and take a short walk to a small broad just off the river end, which is actually just behind the turf fen windmill that's opposite Howe Hill. This is a quiet, sheltered little broad that harbours a great variety of bird life. The arctic terns have nesting platforms. The coots have a ball. Did you know when they dive, it's usually not for fish. They're actually seeking the delicious plants that grow on the bottom of the broad. I always take this trip when I'm on the broads. It's not one of those trips that we can say, I did that before. Each time is a different experience. And believe it or not, 
If you're fortunate, you may even get to see the Chinese water deer that roam in this very place. Or the shy and elusive bitterns that were probably hiding from us on this visit. So back to civilization. The wherry is the Ardea, which spent over 40 years in Paris as a houseboat. When at Howe Hill, be sure to visit the Toad Hole, the eel catcher's cottage. It's free and gives great insight into life here in bygone days. Notably, pre-plastic and pre-central heating, pre-washing machine, and clearly pre-indoor toilet. We've come a long way in the past hundred years. That, by the way, is a hot water bottle in the days when it was a bottle. It was a great visit. Meanwhile, back at Hathor, the school children get their history lesson. The captain gleans some vitamin D. The birds serenade us. And we're back in the 21st century, being tempted to take the wildlife trail that does not allow dogs. That's probably because they may be tempted to kill the wildlife. The pheasants here, by the way, are plentiful. The meadow in the spring is a favorite habitat of the swallowtail butterfly, found only here in Britain. It's indeed a pleasant interlude to be able to get off the boat and walk through the countryside where not only are we serenaded by the birds, but wild flowers are abundant. The foxgloves, amazing, and the colors peaceful. Time to continue our journey. We'll slowly make our way to Ranworth and then back up to Roxham. Coming down the end, we've just left Hell Hill, the sun is shining, we're heading down to Runworth Broad, and it has just been a beautiful day. We're heading down the Ant to Ludham Bridge, it's 4.30 in the afternoon. This is my favourite time to cruise down the river. Another great pleasure of this kind of holiday is that it's really laid back, relaxing. No buses, trains, planes, queues, or timetables. And we get the opportunity to chat and fellowship.
On reaching Ranworth, however, there were no available mooring places, so we got some shots of Mother Grebe with her three chicks riding on her back, presumably to avoid Peter Pike. Believe me, when nature puts on her show, it can be amazing. So on we go, through what are some of the most scenic places on the broads. As we go from Ranworth to Roxham, after a week here, almost nostalgic, as we head back to the boatyard. Morning as serene as usual. Just about everybody's moored up already. The kids get to use the river. Time for sailing lesson, perhaps. Some are getting a tow to Black Horse Broad. Thanks to Herbert Woods, it's open from Easter to mid-September. And this evening, it seems all boats are heading there. It's a great place to learn to sail. Then on to Salhouse Broad. Everybody moored up already. We're just passing through. Roxham Broad next. It's a great place to sail, as it's not sheltered so much from the wind. Then the final stretch. It's been a great week. Why are we moored up in the boatyard, you might ask? There's always a reason. We have an appointment for dinner. The Thai restaurant here being the cause of it all. And as you see the food, you will understand why this was a great way to end our stay. Another great adventure.